Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello, welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a great interview tonight with Lynette Shaw, the founder and proprietor of the Marin Alliance for Medical Marijuana, one of the grandmothers of cannabis uh, medical use here in the United States, and especially down there in the San Francisco Bay Area. She talks about a lot of different things, so stay tuned for a really great interview. We also have, at the end of the show, a little segment with Dr. Thomas Orval. Dr. Orval was a doctor who worked with us at THCF Medical Clinics and Empower Healthcare for more than a decade, helped us open offices in many different states. We started it with him in Washington, but also he worked in Colorado and Arizona, California, uh, Michigan, and Montana. So uh, uh, he, he was a pioneer for medical marijuana. We have a little segment just to honor his memory. So without further ado, if, oh, if you are a loved one, need help finding a medical marijuana doctor, then we have a referral service. Just give us a call at 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. Stay tuned and help us restore him. Good night. I feel the force. I'd like to introduce Lynette Shaw, who is the director and longtime proprietor of the uh, Marin Alliance for Medical Marijuana that's had some historic tangles with the IRS. And also Lynette Shaw Delivers there in the Bay Area of California. Welcome to Cannabis Common Sense, Lynette. Thank you, Paul. I'm, I'm happy and honored to be on your show. We've known each other a long time, but I quit doing interviews for a long time because it wasn't just the IRS that was after me. I was I invented the first license in history to actually sell marijuana in 1997. And I was granted this license from the, the town of Fairfax, California. And six months later, I was sued by President Clinton and spent 19 years in court as a test case to stop the entire cannabis industry nationwide. I was um, I was I had a license eight years before Steve D'Angelo in Harborside. It was the only such license in the nation, so they made me the big target. I was persecuted, I was harassed, they bankrupted me, they seized my social security savings in my lifetime, and they wanted me to cooperate. And of course, I would never cooperate. And they, um, they harassed me for 19 years, um, but we finally prevailed in 2016. And uh, I have a protective order from the federal judge against the, the DOJ because of all the stuff they did to me, which was extremely, well, the judge said it was unconstitutional. It was, it was, they violated my civil rights, the rule of, the rule of law, you know, and common decency. So now the DOJ cannot bother me or anybody else with a license to sell cannabis under any state law. And it was quite an ordeal. Now the IRS is still bothering me, of course, because they, they, they're, the DOJ and the DEA are restrained by judges' orders, but not the IRS. So I'll get out of trouble eventually because, uh, we, you know, I, I had to shut down for five years. I had to flee the area because the agents wouldn't leave me alone. They wouldn't leave the town alone. They wouldn't leave my friends alone. They actually were parked outside my place of business for 16 years. And we still conducted business. And all the patients just came in and said, fuck those meds. <laughs> you know? I need my medicine. And I had to quit doing interviews. I had to basically drop out of the whole movement because I was a danger to everybody in the movement. The agents would follow me, take your take your photo, take the picture of your car, your license number, and try to get people to cooperate, which of course none of us would. And uh, it was quite quite an ordeal. I have post-traumatic stress from it all. And uh, But I prevailed. And I got my place back after five and a half years in the same location they forced me out of. Uh -huh. And uh, and we're open. And 
Now I'm dealing with the local petty bureaucracy, which is, they were, well, Fairfax was invaded by the feds and Marin County was invaded by the feds for 19 years over my case. We were the ones that were holding back the dam, you know, we, I, I had the finger in the dike. And um, because of the harassment of the whole town and the, the, even the police chief was threatened by the federal agents, they, um, that's why Marin only has one brick and mortar. I'm the only brick and mortar still in Marin County because of the harassment from the federal government. And um, when it came time for recreational, the town whose town council was taken over by the anti-marijuana forces, funded by the drug czar, you know, and, and Moms Against Marijuana, which is a group funded by the drug czars, the only such group in the nation was, was funded to come against me because I'm their iconic founding mother, you know. <laughs> They uh, wouldn't allow me to sell adult over the counter. And uh, I had to do an initiative to get adult and then they made it adult delivery. So now I have the only license in the state that is two licenses and I'm not allowed to sell to anyone over the counter who's not registered medical. So I have twice the taxes, twice the paperwork, twice the hassle, and it's very unfair. We're gonna do another initiative next year to change this. It's, uh, it's, uh, this the, petty, the petty bureaucracy is still har harassing me, but the DEA cannot come and they can't come after you or anybody else. So it's, that's the crowning achievement of my career. <laughs> you know, it's pretty big. Well, time. thank you. It's been a, a big uh, uh, ordeal for you. It's really almost unbelievable. I too have been targeted by the IRS. They, back in 2009, took away our 501c3 nonprofit status yep. for uh, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, which is still an Oregon nonprofit, but mm -hmm. not a uh, federal one. And so, uh, yeah, they're they're still after me. They go to my landlord. My landlord says the IRS came by, Paul, and they told me not to tell you, but he told me. So yeah. Uh, yeah. anyway, cooperating with our side. <laughs> but it, it goes back, you know. A lot of people today think that they've been doing the mar marijuana industry for three or four years, and that makes them an old timer. Right. Uh, and. They don't understand that when you and I started at this, it was not an industry. It yep. was a movement. And it was a revolution. It was a revolutionary a enterprise, according yeah. to the police. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a revolution, and it was a peaceful revolution. And um, I, I started this a long time ago, even in high school, years ago. I, I thought marijuana should be legal. My parents freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my college money because my dad caught me smoking a joint behind the shed in the backyard and he threw me out of the house and took away my college money. And so I had to work my way through college by selling pot. You know? <laughs> Just like Bill Maher. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the singing, I'm still singing. I, you know, I was a professional vocalist for a long time, but I had to stop doing gigs because of the feds. I couldn't even perform music in public without having the agents bothering people in my audience. So wow. it was, they spent millions trying to get me to cooperate and trying to scare me. And um, I'm from the country, you know? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a spoiled person. I'm not from a rich family, um, self-made person. Um, and uh, like my friend says, Lynette, you're from the country. You know how to pick up a shovel and dig. And I'm part Welsh too. And you know, the Welsh are the fiercest fighters in the world. So <laughs> I definitely was. Fit, uh, so know. when medical marijuana first passed, on the ballot in 1996, Prop 215. How were you involved in that campaign? I was actually part of the committee that developed 215. I was Jack Harris' petition trainer and I was Dennis Prone's secretary. And I was Jack's secretary too at the same, at the same five year period. They were trading me back and forth between Northern California and Southern California. So uh -huh. um, I was on the de development committee for Prop 215. And uh, when we, we filed it and qualified, I was tapped to train the petitioners because I've been training Jack's petitioners for the hemp petition. So I was sent all over the state and trained thousands of people how to petition for marijuana. I got uh, some, some critical, critical patients to, who look good on camera to testify for the major media coverage. And, um, and I worked tirelessly on the campaign and we won. You know, yeah. we won. What people don't know is that uh... Back in 1996, Proposition 215 was the first successful marijuana initiative, which in would uh, which set up medical marijuana for any condition a doctor thought it might be useful yes. for. That was and, Dr. Todd Picaria's uh, ad addition, which was brilliant. You know, yeah. Was simple, too. That's what Dennis wanted. He wanted it to be simple, could leave things open, but make it very clear 
that the medical patients could not be arrested, you know, and we would have access. And that they didn't specify dispensaries, but if having access was the question thing. And then when I developed the license, it was um, it was also the first in the world to have an actual license to sell marijuana legally. And my police chief actually, who I educated through this whole ordeal, we, Marin County is a small but and powerful county. We're very wealthy here. Most people are not, but you know. And we yeah. have, we at the time in 1996, we had number two in the nation per capita for HIV AIDS and number one in breast cancer to this day. We have the most breast cancer in the nation. And we don't know why. Uh, one in three women will develop breast cancer who live in Marin. And we don't know why, because we don't have polluting industries here. We don't have our air is clean, our water is clean. We all eat organic food. We have outdoor recreations. It's a, it's a very healthy area. We have the, we're, we're right by the, Marin is actually like marine. We're right by the coast. We have good salt air. We have ocean. We have trees. It, it's yeah. another end of the Golden Gate Bridge. So yeah. you San Francisco on one side and Marin County on the other yeah. side. You know, with breast cancer, a lot of it is genetically driven. So it doesn't matter what your environment is, your your genes, that BRCA gene and a, a, a host of other genes that are involved in that. That's why it's often hereditary and passed yeah. down in families. So yeah, they also think it might be something to do with uh, the stress of being a, a, a living and working so hard uh there's a lot of alcoholism which might have something to do with it there is a lot of um, trophy wives that would get abused uh, they, uh it's it's very uh, it's a very perplexing situation and i still get a lot of breast cancer sufferers here we have a fairly mixed population though it's it's still predominantly white um but uh, it's it's very it's perplexing like i said but I'm still dealing with the breast cancer people. Our women who use cannabis have the highest rate of survival in the county. You know, that, that's by far. And that's the, the, one of the motivations that keep me going is that when I see this type of statistic and knowing that I directly help people survive by, you know, the hundreds, that's why you keep fighting. You know, saving lives by the hundreds is, is, is not easy, but it's very important. If you can do yeah. it, you got to do it. And that's why I kept fighting. You know? Yeah, it's it's very spiritually rewarding, I exactly. find, being able to help people. And especially in this fight with, can, you know, uh, cannabis helping so many different forms of cancer in particular. Our last show was with uh, Dr. Joe Goldstrich. And he has a new book out, The Cannabis Cancer Connection. It's mm -hmm. a wealth of information. So right now, though, with your, your brick and mortar storefront, you're only able to sell to medical patients. Well, here's what here's what we do. I have a very smart lawyer, many smart lawyers actually, thank goodness. Always get a real smart lawyer, you know? Yeah, that's and important. They, and when they came with this cockamamie adult delivery only beca because the mayor of town was the president of Moms Against Marijuana at the time. And there was no getting around this blockade. Even though we had an initiative, they disqualified our initiative through some minor technical thing, but they gave us the adult delivery. So my my uh, lawyer said, Lynette, here is the statute, hand delivery and pickup. He said, rent the, rent the office next door and have them walk next door. And so we walk next door about 100 times a day to deliver to the adults. And we sell over the counter to, and it's embarrassing. I have to apologize to all the customers, but they're so happy they can come into a brick and mortar, look at what they ha we have, pick it out, bag it up, and then we walk them next door for the transaction. It's all in camera in California. It's overly regulated. It's overly taxed. We're triple taxed on everything. Companies are, are tanking. They're, they're, Garcia's company moved out of California. A lot of company, companies that you enjoy are, are no longer in California because they can't afford the taxes and the fees. But when you say Garcia's company, you mean Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead? Yes, the Grateful Dead pot company that was had fabulous pot had to leave California because they couldn't make any money due to huh. the taxation and the fees. For example, my tiny little store, which is 450 square feet of sales floor, I have That's to take $16,500 a year for my license from the state. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that's a, that's a small store. If I want to get, a, now I can't get a growing license because the town is still lost in the, the dark ages. And we're going to have to change the town council to fix so it. So there are no other adult dispensaries in Marin County? 
Nope, no medical, no adult. I'm the only one. So they have to basically come to you if they're medical or drive out of the county if... Uh, well, there's some, there's some delivery services. That, there's three or four out of San Rafael, but they're expensive and they, we have the much better pot. I have... Are you able to deliver to a, for adult use customers and not just medical? I can deliver to both medical and adult use. Oh, okay. Um, but what people prefer to do is come to the club, look at what they got, choose what they want, and then walk next door, you know, five feet. So right. like the majority of my deliveries are hand deliveries. And I, I do maybe a car delivery once a week. You know, and everybody rather actually go to the store, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's better for the town. This is what's so crazy. Is I bring thousands of people to town every month. And they come to town, they buy gas, they go to the store, they go to the restaurant, they, you know, they, they go get gifts for Christmas. I pack the town with customers every month. And this... Um, this off the off the track town council doesn't appreciate this at all, and so what we're going to have to do is is change the town council. Actually, you know? yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. Of course, yeah, that, we're working that. on. They, they've done a lot of terrible things, and apparently they're paid off by some developer group, and and the corruption is is in my little town. The corruption is just ghastly. It's everywhere, unfortunately. That's how we had our company stolen. Basically, it was through mm -hmm. corruption, forgeries, lies. The IRS harassing us, yeah. all of that stuff at the same time. So yeah, I'm a sole proprietor, which is which is a hassle, and it leaves me liable for everything. But I never had a business partner, and I, and I and I never had any board or anything like that. So everything is on me. But they can't, they can't. Nobody can mess with me, you know. They can they can threaten me. I can put on payment plan with the IRS, but there, no one is in charge of this except for me. I have no board. I have nobody. Now, this is not very good for my ta I, my taxes or anything, but this is how I've been able to keep control of everything, despite the onslaught from the feds uh, and all this crazy people trying to get me to give them the club. And men who don't like it that a woman can be in charge have tried to threaten me, have tried to seduce me, have tried to sue me, everything to get a hold of my club. And nobody can do that. They just can't. I'm a sole proprietor. And the town will not allow me to incorporate because they're stuck in the Middle Age, the Dark Ages, you know, medieval thinking here. Well, so, let's go um, back again to uh, November of 1996. Uh, yes. At this point, we're talking 27 years ago, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's when Prop 215 passed, the first medical marijuana bill in mm -hmm. the country. And before the IRS started harassing you and everything, Tell me what happened then, how you came to found the uh, Marin Alliance for Medical Marijuana. Well, I was open before uh, as, a, as a campaign headquarters because we were gathering signatures all over Marin County. I was in charge of statewide. I was a, a signature gathering. This, and, um, I met right now, was also a petition office initially. And yeah. Marijuana legalization on the ballot in 2012. So it's awesome. the same dynamic. Yeah, and so I was there, and I was secretly doing the club thing because I've been delivering from. De I was on Dennis's staff in San Francisco, and, and I that's had, Dennis Perron. Dennis, Dennis Perron, yeah, Dennis uh, Perron. the founder of the San Francisco Medical uh, Marijuana Buyers Club. Yes, with, Cannabis Buyers Club like, San Francisco was the first in history to have this outlet for AIDS patients in the Castro, and I met everyone. I think including you in, at the Hall of Flowers in April of 1991 which was yes. the beginning of the revolution. And Jack Herr had sent me to Dennis and Pebbles had sent me to Dennis, Pebbles Trippett. And when Dennis met me, he said, oh, you, you seem like a nice girl. You wanna come, uh, you know, then Jack and, and Pebbles say, you're okay. You wanna come work at the, at the pot club? And I said, well, let's go take a look. So I went to the pot club, it was in April of 1991. And I walked into a crisis center, you know? And, and it, was the, it was the crossroads the crossroads of the drug war and a medical crisis and a social crisis. And these people were as big as my little finger. They were dying and, and, and couldn't keep weight on. And I walked in, I started to cry because they were actually smiling. And they were in that little cannabis club above Church Street. And there was hundreds of people coming in and out. I said, Dennis, what do you need to do? My mom was a Quaker, you know? So, you know, I was trained well as a young person. I said, Dennis, what do you need me to do? He goes, well, I need you to talk to the patients. You seem like a nice girl. I said, well, yeah, <laughs> I am a nice girl. 
And so I was uh, an intake counselor for him for five years. I, I, I did the intakes for, I don't know, six, 7,000 patients. And I learned about medical, after, after the first wave of AIDS patients, we started getting the cancer patients. Then we started getting the lupus patients. Then we started getting the seizure patients. And then we started getting every kind of severe illness I never heard of come through the doors because they, the word was out. And I learned all this stuff about medical things. I never, I mean, I'm a musician. I'm, I'm good with people. I can entertain. I, I'm, you know, I'm good at communicating. I'm unafraid of the camera. But boy, when I, when this, I, I never heard of lupus. And this poor girl came in suffering terribly. And, she, and I talked to her for a while and I guided her to what, I think you need some sativa, but try this indica at night and that will help you maybe with the seizures and stuff. And within 10 days, she brought her entire lupus support group in to talk to me. So all of a sudden, we, I walked, she walked in with 15 lupus sufferers and said, here's, here's the lady, talk to this lady. And she looked so much better in two weeks. And they all came in to get access. You know, and that's what I knew that it, it was like, I, I'm here for, you know, this is the mission from God kind of thing, you know. And I cried a lot there and it still makes me cry because it, it was so intense and so real and so important and so compassionate and so dangerous all at the same time. You know, it was, it was very dangerous. I was on the front lines of the drug war and, and people dying left and right. And, uh, and the police periodically came in and busted down the door and trashed the place and stole everything, right? Well, no, actually. Uh, Dennis, of course, had been dear friends with Harvey Milk and had lots of connections at City Hall. And uh, because this was such a crisis, and when I first joined the pot club in San Francisco, the Cannabis Buyers Club SF, right? Dennis told me that the year before, there had been 40,000 patients that had that had been diagnosed with HIV AIDS, you know? In that one year, 25,000 had died and there was 15,000 left in one year. And that those 15,000 people, half of them were coming to Dennis's club and they were the ones who survived. The other ones that weren't using pot were dropping off, you know, like left and right. And it was just astounding that they, that they could so bravely hold up this little pot flag in the middle of the drug war and help people not die. It was, it was just incredible. But I got to tell you this one story. This is, this is where the turning point came really for me emotionally and everybody working. I'll never forget because it was April 15th, 1990, 1991. And I've been working for a few months there. Right? I started working, April, no, it was, excuse me, it was April 18th, 1993. Because I've been working there for two months. So I heard about the danger. We heard about the feds. We heard about the agents. They were parked across the street. Here's how you tell with their shiny shoes. Here's... You know, let us know when you're walking in from the bus depot if you see A, B, C, D. You know, we were always on alert. We're always looking out the windows. And um, April 15, 1994, let me correct this for the record, because it was tax day. It was 1994. And there have been agents coming, trying to come in. We wouldn't let them in. We had big bodyguards and stuff. And Dennis got a call from City Hall and, uh, the day before on the 14th. And he called the whole staff, said, you gotta come to San Francisco. So I went to San Francisco and went to Dennis's kitchen table up in the Castro at the castle. And he said, okay, staff, we're gonna get arrested tomorrow. They're coming, the city hall called and they're gonna arrest, we're gonna catch a case and we're gonna get a trial and we're gonna have the people decide what to do about medical marijuana. We go, oh, Dennis, we don't wanna get arrested. We don't wanna go to jail. Oh no, what, what's, can't we just close down? Oh, Dennis, <laughs> all of us were whining, right? And there was a staff was like 10, you know? And he, he pounds his fist on his kitchen table and says, are you men or are you mice? You have to stand up for what you believe in. I'm gonna be arrested. Are you gonna be with me? We go, oh, Dennis, we're gonna be arrested tomorrow, <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> I got on the bus in Marin and I, I, had my, I had my glasses on instead of my contacts because you know, I was gonna go to jail. <laughs> and I get out of the bus in San Francisco, it's around the corner from the, cast, from the Church Street location. And I was met by a group of patients, you know, about a half dozen. Oh, Lynette, we're gonna escort you down to the club. And I said, well, aren't the police there? No, not yet, they're not there yet. And I walked around the corner and I'll be damned, but the whole city block was surrounded by our patients. There was thousands of them linking their little tiny skinny arms 
in the streets of San Francisco, in the Castro, chanting. And then they saw me as one of the staff members and the whole place cheered. I mean, you could hear it all through the cast. Yay, Lynette's here. Yay, we just protect our people, right? And so we walked down, we walked down to Church Street and the whole place is just packed with people. And they have their wheelchairs and they have their walkers and they have their canes. And they're all these, you know, sick, wonderful people linking their little arms to protect us. So it was like the Red Sea party. And I'm going down the sidewalk and they, they're all cheering. And, and as I'm walking up the steps, they're all cheering. There's people inside and, in, and we go up the steps into the Church Street Club and there was surrounding us. There was everybody on staff with Dennis and candles surrounding us three people deep inside the club outside the club, up the steps, around the entire city block. We had thousands of people there to protect us. Still makes me cry. And then, the, you know, the first truck comes up, the paddy wagons comes, it's the San Francisco police. Boo, go away, leave our people alone. They're waking, you know, they're just raising hell, right? They pull away. Then the sheriff paddy wagon comes. Boo, go away, leave our people alone. You know, so they, they were there a little bit longer and the sheriff goes away. And then the major media shows up because you know, Dennis is on the phone calling all this all this media people, right? Smart. And then they, they, we have CNN, we have channel two, three, five, seven, we got everybody there, right? And then the big black paddy wagon pulls up. It's the feds. It's the feds. And it's they got, you know, and they got it, they they got the big black one. D-E-A, go away, D-E-A, go away. You know, and the major media's there, the cameras are rolling, the newspapers are there, the radio stations are there. And they sat there for about half an hour and everybody's chanting and more and more people are showing up and it turns into this huge, huge, huge crowd covering the streets, the sidewalks all over the place, right? And then finally, the big black paddy wagon pulls ever so slowly away and everybody's cheering. You can hear it resounding through the cast. Yay! Yay! You know, and we're, sitting, we're stunned inside. We were all expecting to, to, for them to tear down the doors and bust us and carry us away, right? And we're waiting and waiting. Are they going to come back? Are they just circling around? What the hell's going to happen? We waited for 90 minutes. 90 minutes. And we're all scared to death. We're all crying. And he gets a phone call from City Hall. Dennis, you did it. They're not coming. And we're just stunned, right? And, and everybody's cheering and we, we call out the windows. They're not coming. They went away. You did it, people. The power to the people, you know. And then another 90 minutes later, in comes the duffel bags full of pot because there was not a single gram of pot in that club. <laughs> you know? And we didn't want to lose our medicine. It was hard to get and expensive. Right. You know? expensive. And so then, then we opened back up and we gave it away to everybody who'd been there defending us. We gave away pot the rest of the day. You know, and that's when I knew that we could win, we could win at the ballot and we could legalize medical marijuana. But it was one of the most frightening ordeals I've ever been through. And then also the most inspiring. And, um, and I'll, 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 you know, it still makes me cry. And uh, I'll never, ever, ever forget that spirit that kept me going, especially after I, I got sued by President Clinton years later. This is in 1998, I got sued by President Clinton and I've spent 19 years in court as the test case to stop the cannabis industry, because I had the only license for, well, I had the only license in the world for eight years, and then uh, D'Angelo got his license because my court case was stopping the feds. So this was else. the IRS, and so uh, uh, the IRS was saying that you're the start of the 280E prosecutions. Really, 280E still affects the the cannabis industry now. Yes, it was the start of the implementation of this tax code, which says that uh, uh, basically if you're involved in an illegal enterprise, you can't take regular well, deduction. 280E was first, was first shot at uh, Champs, which had, a, uh, which had a dispensary in San Francisco. And then they came after me and I'm the sole proprietor. There wasn't any group of people that, that could divide up the stress, you know? So right. they, they 280E'd me after, I had talked to been talking to the IRS for 15 years. I had done everything the IRS told me to do. I they told me to take normal tax deductions and file my taxes. I filed everything I was supposed to. And after 15 years, they removed all my tax deductions I had submitted for 15 years and sent me a bill for 
$10.5 million. Well, and when you get a bill for $10.5 million, you can either like die of a heart attack or laugh. So I laughed my way through that, you know. So what but, year um, that? that was uh, 98? That was, that was not actually, that was, tw they did that in 2011. Oh, okay. 15 years later, after I've been dutifully paying everything they told me to pay by the IRS. Right. They, they reversed everything and they uh, charged me all this money. And then um, they weren't going to let me deduct the cost of pot. And because I, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to have a head shop or anything else other than cannabis in my place of business because of the strict rules I had. That meant that every single thing that I had could not be deducted. My heroic tax lawyer, David Hellman, who's now no longer with us, but he, he went in front of the IRS judge and turned into Superman. I swear, David Hellman, you know, um, he is the one, his case is, is the one that made them allow me to deduct the cost of pot. And that's that's also saved everybody else in the industry. It was it was my case with David Hellman defending the right to deduct the cost of pot. Now we didn't get the, the we didn't get the rent, we didn't get the payroll, we didn't get the insurance, but the cost of pot is seventy five percent of my expenses. So that allowed us still to stay open. And um, but they did then they seized my lifetime savings of Social Security. So I have you know, I haven't heard of that happening before. So they went into your. Your Social Security trust fund money that they take out of your payroll and they make you pay, and they 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 took that. They took that six figures. They took my retirement away, you know. So now when I do finally get a Social Security check, it's the minimum, rather than something. So like they they didn't put it back after you nope. won your case. Nope, nope. I can't get it back because at the time when they did it, it was a legal seizure. Uh huh. And uh, I, this is one of the really rotten things that they did. So I have no, no, yeah. I have no retirement. I can never retire. I'm going to die in the harness, you know. But um, and then also the harassment by the feds for from the they didn't 280e mean uh, Clinton. President Clinton sued me in 1998. They did not audit me until 2011, and I was in court the entire time for years, years and years. At one point, I was when they first sued us there was six of us that were sued it was dennis it was it was six clubs oakland uh myself ukiah dennis and a couple others and and dennis and the other three shut down it was me oakland and ukiah my girl in ukiah passed away from her terrible illness and it was me in oakland and then they also went after valerie at valerie corral down in santa cruz and so they added her case to our case for marijuana wham yeah wham and so then uh, we let oakland go forward i just held back because because you're innocent until proven guilty. And we also, they never raided me. I never got raided. And as it turned out, the prosecutor finally admitted after several years to Greg Anton, my wonderful attorney, that I had the constitution on my side because of double jeopardy. So if I had a civil case for marijuana in, in, in court, in the federal court, they could not raid me for the same issue. So we kept that case alive. You know, we, we, we appealed and we appealed, we appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And we kept that case alive, figuring that we would have some break. It was, it was 16 years we were in court and still open. And the federal agents were parked outside my club for that whole time. They were parked outside my house. They were following me everywhere. They would come up to me. And if I was singing in a nightclub, they'd come up to me after I got off stage and bother me. And they wanted me to cooperate. They wanted me to to give up people and, and just cooperate lady and we'll go easy on you. I said, no, you're not, you know, <laughs> you may, you may have your, your hand, your hands on me a little bit, but you're not going to get anybody else. No matter how rotten anybody been to me, no matter what, it's still war. And I would get, I would not give up a single person. The ones who threatened to kill me, I wouldn't give any of them up because this is war and people go crazy in war. And for me to take the brunt of the, of the heat, to break the hunt, brunt of the jealousy, to take the brunt of the, the, the hatred. You know, that was, that was why I think I was chosen by the great powers because I'm tough, you know? And I don't have a family. I don't have a child. I don't have a husband. They, my, my one sister is hours away and, and is, is, she's autistic and, you know, not involved. So um, they couldn't get to me through my family. I had no family. 
and they couldn't get to me through threatening me because, you know, I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. My Quaker background kept me strong and um, it was terrible, but I survived. And uh, even though I didn't get my social security back, I, I've got the club back. After we won, it was just astonishing. 2016, we, they'd taken the landlord's land. The only way to get me closed was to seize the landlord's land, which they did in tw uh, 2011 um, after they did the 280E on me. And that didn't stop me. Uh, they seized the landlord's land. And that's when I had- You must have had a really good landlord. I had a great landlord. I still do. It's the same guy. Oh, okay. you he got was, it. Mr. Uzazi, bless his heart, he's 80, 87 now. His uncle went through cancer and had used marijuana illegally. You know, this is like 30 years ago. And so he said, help these people. And that did help my uncle. And, um, and he went through hell. And he, they took away his land. It's worth $10, 15000000 million over my little tiny club, right? And after a year or so, he got it back because he had to sign a settlement saying that he would never rent to me or any dispensary for the rest of his life, nor could his heirs. Only, and it was the only such seizure in the nation. Thousands of, thousands of places lost their lease out of fear, rightfully so. And then, he, and then they held it until um, we actually won in court and then we filed an appeal. So when, here's the, the court case that after, this is year 19. And I'm really tired of having these guys out front of my house, you know? I had to flee for a while. I, I moved to LA because it's a different jurisdiction federally, you know? The, my tail had to stop in Bakersfield where the third district entered in. And we left the Ninth Circuit and went to the Third Circuit. And since I had committed no marijuana crimes in, in LA as far as they knew, <laughs> they couldn't, they had no jurisdiction in, in Southern California. So I was able to safely escape to Southern California and, and have some peace of mind, though I couldn't work anywhere in the industry because it was a world case. They knew I had an injunction. They knew that if I showed up in any dispensary, the feds would show up eventually. So I could not work anywhere in the nation in the industry as, as experienced and as knowledgeable as I am. So um, I couldn't find any jobs. I, I sold out my stash. You know, I, I had several pounds left over at the closure of the club. And I was doing after hours pot sales to the stars in Hollywood, like I have done for years. You know. And that's when I met the, one of the founders of the Wu-Tang Clan. And um, he uh, wanted me to go out with him. And I said, I can't go out with you. I, I'm, being, I'm on the lam from the feds and you're, you're being chased by TMZ. I can't go out with any famous guys. Are you kidding? You know? So he chased me around, chased me around for weeks. And he finally said, Lynette, I'm Wu-Tang. I've been chased by the feds before. I can fix this. I said, I can't even go to the store. You know, he says, I'll have someone come over tomorrow. The next day I got a little knock on my little apartment there and here's this big guy, big, beautiful black man. He says, hi, I'm Brandy. I'm Tupac's half brother. I'm here to guard you. I said, really? He says, yeah, I got a bulletproof Jeep right here. So, <laughs> so since Cyril Law had fixed it, I could go anywhere, I could shop, you know, and I had somebody watching over me. So I ended up uh, being with Sincere for six years until he passed away from cancer. And that definitely changed my dynamic in Hollywood. I was very safe and I was playing music again. I thought I could have you know, some kind of relief from all this drama. And um, then the Republicans changed the law where if you had were deficit spending, it was a felony because Obama was a big deficit spender and they had removed the budget for prosecuting medical marijuana but I still didn't get my injunction lifted. But when they made it a felony to deficit spend, that means that if they prosecuted me, they could, they, they could be arrested with a felony for violating that law. So I called my lawyer and I said, well, can I go back to work now? And they said, well, you should, it's a long shot. They hate you. And I go, yeah, no, let's try. So we went back to court. We filed in San Francisco and I moved back up from LA to fight for the club. And we were in court with the guys from DC and this one little, this woman from DC prosecutor and very snippy and not nice. And she gets up and my, my attorney, Greg Anton says, well, there's 35,000 licensed dispensaries now at the time. Now there's 350 or so, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't my client go back to work since a felony to prosecute her? And she gets up and says, we don't care what anyone else has. She just can't have a dispensary in open court. Right. 
And my judge, bless his heart, jumps up furious and points the finger of shame at the prosecution. Do you remember equal justice under the law? You know? And I, I'm, I'm hanging on to my bench. I'm looking at my lawyer. He's looking at me. And my girlfriend, who's watching this, leans and whispers to me, Lynette, you just won your case. <laughs> you know? And then he excoriates the prosecution for violating the Constitution, rule of law, due process, my civil rights, and common decency. And uh, I walked out of the court stunned. And the, the, all the media was there and stuff. And they go, Lynette, I think you won your case. And I said, well, we'll have to wait for the decision. <laughs> and, uh, and so the decision came three months later. And not only did they overturn all that, my injunction, I had a protective order from the judge because of all those reasons he had been furious about, rightfully so. So then I had to do something to about the landlord because the landlord had signed a settlement on the base of the injunction, but the injunction had been lifted and that made the settlement moot. So we had to save the landlords because I couldn't go back to anywhere else but the location that I had the license for. It was very site specific. So we filed and right then Donald Trump came in and I said, oh my God, what's gonna happen now, right? Do you remember when Donald Trump fired all the prosecutors at the DOJ? He fired my, he, he fired my prosecutor for almost 20 years. And because the enemy of my enemy is my friend, he let me go. He let my landlord go. And I got the same deal that, uh, that Steve D'Angelo's landlord had. And I was able to open up in the same location they had forced me out of five years previously. And I've been back open ever since. And, uh, and the agents have not been seen at all anywhere in Marin County. You know? So it was, it was very intense. And um, I... Um, I had nightmares for a long time. I used a lot of pot, you know, and um, I didn't have any well, thank social life. So. Thank you for going through the ringer for all the rest of us. And oh, you're welcome. So many people don't know this story at all. I'm so happy that yeah. you came here and 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 shared it with us. I'm finally writing a book about it. I have a, my friend who's helping me ghostwrite because of my trauma. It's hard for me to to write, but I can sure. talk about it. And it's, it's, it, it's much easier for me to just talk about it than to write about it. So I have a documentary contract. I'm working on that and I'm working on the book. And I just talked to a publisher who wants to put this book all over the world because this is, this is a one woman revolution that changed the world, you know? And I also I feel like a, the mission from God kind of thing, you know? I wasn't, I, I could have been a rock star, you know, I, I'm a very good singer and I'm very blessed with many musical talents, but circumstances drew me to something even greater than being a musician rock star. What I did helped save the world from the drug war. We broke the back of the drug war with the dispensary system, you know, and now there's thousands and thousands and thousands of dispensaries all over the world that are my godchildren. Every licensed dispensary is my godchild. I'm the founder. They don't know. They we got yeah. you know, that's the thing. You get this uh, erasure of history if we don't yeah. let people know that. Right. And the right. thing is, it's not over yet. The IRS is still out there. They won't give you back your money. Mm -hmm. They're at, I still have them harassing me. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this whole plethora of crazy regulations, you know. Yes that were over-regulated. Cannabis has never killed anybody, nope. but the laws against cannabis have. And so- uh, it's In California, it's, it's even worse than what you guys have. It's insane what they've done. And yeah, I, no, I've talked to my senator, I've talked right. to my assemblyman, and they're willing to carry a bill to, for tax relief. So I've got my attorney working on that. It's another attorney now. Um, I got, still have attorneys. I still have to pay for attorneys all the time. I have a tax attorney. I have a- the, uh, the the California state liaison, you know, uh, I have it's 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 very stressful, but I'm tough, and also I did the right thing, and now now the story is gonna. I could not go to the media and discuss it. I didn't want to scare everybody. I wanted people to go forward with their little dispensary licenses and and have safety in numbers. When I was the only one in the world with a license, I was the big target. Now there's, I don't know, 350,000 dispensaries across the nation, maybe more, you know, and, and, and that's also what helped me win the case. 
because it's safety in numbers. And the more dispensaries but we have. The IRS is still enforcing 280E against yeah. marijuana businesses, saying that we're a continuing criminal enterprise. I know. Uh, not you know, any relief yet. And, um, overregulated gonna... and overtaxed. And, you know, yeah. it's all just a setup to transfer this to the big corporations. You know, yeah. my clinic, I, I was blessed to, when Todd McCurria passed, I took over his business for about nine months before I sold it back to his sister. Mm -hmm. But uh, we helped a quarter, over a quarter of a million medical marijuana patients just in our clinics alone across nine states. You so rock, I, that made us a target, though. Yeah. And I was very I proud of you, but I was very you know, afraid to you. George Soros put $10 million into a Israeli energy company, Adira, that that was really to take us out. And they they did that. They took right. us out financially. Yeah. But now, the reason I bring this up is all of our records belong to the Kronos Group. And the Kronos Group is aligned with the Altria Group. And Altria used to be called Philip Morris. Mm. They're the owners of Marlboro Tobacco. Wow. So our 270,000 patient records are now in the hands of Marlboro Tobacco, the Marlboro Man. Jesus. And Altria just spent $750 million to buy an Israeli medical marijuana pin company, which is also aligned with these Kronos people. Hmm. So you, you look at the people who came after, it's not just George Soros, it's not right. just Marlboro Tobacco, it's that guy with the Blackwater, uh, Prince, Eric hmm. Prince. He, he was involved in it. We could see from the financial transactions that our friend Doug McVeigh dug up. You know, it's this wow. whole corporate secret state. And Soros, Soros put a million out bucks. Of and take over everything. Yeah, you George know? Soros put in a million bucks to 215 and George Zimmerman from Men's Warehouse. So that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. But that, that that money that Soros put in is what saved us for the from two fifteen. Yeah. We had a we had to buy a, a professional petitioning company, and I went to work for them to get to teach everyone how to take how to get signatures. Oh. Now the the business in California has reverted back to the underground. Seventy five percent of all marijuana sales are now black market. Where under the collective rules, seventy five percent of the sales were through the collectives. So they've they've completely ruined the market and, and I'm just barely staying open, but because I'm small and because I'm a sole proprietor, uh, I know how to survive. We were on a skeleton crew for a while. I was able to get a couple more people on staff so I can take a vacation for the first time in many years. Um, but what they don't understand is particularly in pot growing areas like your Oregon and my California, is that we can throw a couple of seeds in the backyard and spit and the thing grows 10 feet, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're never gonna be able to stop us. And uh, we're gonna survive through all this onslaught. Nobody likes crappy corporate pot. I can't sell it. I have right. the organic stuff that was grown in Northern California. It's the best in the world. You cannot replicate that anywhere else. You can do it in Southern Oregon and Northern California. And that's really where the best pot in the world is grown. So they're going to have to come to peace in, in terms to get that quality. Otherwise, these like what happened with some of the, the bigger Marlboro came in Northern California. This is why I know this. They bought up a huge property, right? They paid three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the biggest license that they weren't supposed to give out for five years, but it took them five months to change their mind, right? They put in all this terrible mach machinery and hired a bunch of kids that didn't know how to grow pot, you know, local kids, because no one would work for them. At minimum wage, probably. At minimum wage, grew lousy pot, lost their butts, packed up and left, and left this huge mess at this huge farm. So what the growers did is they got 10 small growers who go in on the farm, and they're now growing organically on that same space, and they got 10, 10 small farms out of that one debacle. And so that's what I think is going to happen. They're going to try to try to pass off this bad weed and people are not going to want that. And they're going to flee and we're going to end up with our land and the, and the meek shall inherit the earth. You know, you know, we, we sorely need hemp for 
paper and building materials and uh, uh, fabric and seeds for food and energy and biomass energy. This yep. is really, like Jack Herrer said, and when he first said it, I thought it was kind of crazy, but it, it was kooky. I know. <laughs> that, uh, you know, this is the plant that can save the planet and yeah. or save what's left of the biosphere, which we inherited and we need to pass on to future generations. And so the other thing is that cannabis is a bellwether, I think, for the future of freedom for humans. If we can't you know, be happy with our cannabis and replace the petrochemical industry. The future of humanity and freedom with the advent of artificial intelligence is dire indeed. So we're it's fighting scary. for Yeah, future. I agree. I agree. We, but also I know as a as a a, a general in the in the revolution and a leader of the resistance that the human spirit will not be subjugated even though they they subjugated slaves for hundreds of years they won their freedom because they, they you know because we they resisted and they and they got people to cooperate with them for the right reasons and that's also what happened for the for cannabis is that we resist i went to jail i got beat up and went for jail for cannabis that's when i went to jail for cannabis i was so pissed and that's right when i was waiting to go to jail after getting busted and beat up and my whole place wrecked and all this stuff right i met jack Hare at a lecture in, in up in uh, occidental up in sonoma county and he gave me this book because i was broke and i was going to go to jail for pot and for where's no clothes and i read that book when i was sitting on the beach waiting to go to jail for pot my whole my whole life changed overnight when I read the book because I was no longer crazy. I was right. I was using marijuana, terrible criminal like my dad, the IRS agent said. My dad was a federal agent. You know, that's, he threw me out rather than arrest me. But um, I knew that I was right and that this, this society was wrong and that the laws are wrong and that when I went to jail for pot, I was I was starting, already starting to work for Dennis and I went to jail. I was off the staff at the cannabis club. I called him from jail. I called K Mud from jail, you know, because I was just so pissed. And I memorized The Emperor Wears No Clothes. I taught the women about that book when I was in jail. And when I came out of jail, 80 days later, because I got time off for, I had a 120 day sentence, which is better than three years. And uh, we took a deal and uh, I got out of jail and I was so pissed and I didn't reform. I was, I went right to the front lines, asked Dennis for my job back and I worked full time for Dennis for five years after that. And Jack, they were throwing me back and forth. I was angry, I was hurt. I had been, you know, so disrespected. And I and I also I knew that I was right, and Jack was right, and Dennis was right, and you are right, Paul. We're all correct that this is wrong, and that's why I, I kept working so hard to correct this terrible evil on society, and we broke the back of the drug war. <laughs> it's still and, uh, more work, but we're working at it and passing. We're still on working on it. Generation. Yeah. With your great hey example, guys. I really appreciate you coming on. If somebody wants to reach out to the Marin Alliance for Medical Marijuana or Lynette Shaw Delivers, you want to give out your website or any contact information? Yeah, sure. It's it's uh, MarinCBC.com, Marin Cannabis Buyers Club, MarinCBC.com. The phone number is the best way to reach us, 415. 295-7633. And we're in Marin County in little old Fairfax still at 6 School Street, number 210. It's the same location now for uh, since 1996. Then we had a five-year vacation. <laughs> I got the same location back and we're still thriving. Even with this silly adult delivery thing that the 
was foisted upon me by the drug czar funded Moms Against Marijuana. And you know, the IRS is still after me because they, they are they resent the fact that we broke the back of the drug war. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure that until we win win, that I will never be left alone. But uh it was worth it. And uh, you know, and I'm I'm heading to my 70th birthday this month. And, you know, and I'm 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 perfect example that marijuana keeps you young and lively. I have no health issues. I'm going to be around for a very long time. And uh, even though uh, even though I went through hell, I came out smelling like a rose. <laughs> well, we've had Lynette Shaw and on the, on here. I want to thank you for coming on, Lynette, and keep working to restore him. That's you right. Know. Now we got we got to go fix the hemp problem too. Right? That's right. And, and we got a lot of prisoners to release. We still got prisoners across the nation. Sixty thousand of them still. I I thought it might be helpful uh, in on the program here to take an entity that we see with some frequency uh, in our clinics. And last week we talked about uh, degenerative disc disease, which is ubiquitous. Uh, in the public, and uh, today it might be worthwhile just saying a few things about a disease that is called a demyelinating disease. It's a disease that is uh, associated with your immune system. Now, your immune system is a system that is constantly on guard for anything foreign in your body. If I was to have a splinter in my hand uh, today, Tomorrow morning when I woke up, there would be uh, redness around the area of the splinter and very uh, frequently a little bit of purulent material. And this is all mandated by your system of protection in your body. Cells, T cells, lymphocytes, polymorphonuclear nuclear uh, leukocytes. These are cells that are constantly on guard for anything foreign. Now the diseases that are very frustrating for us are called uh, diseases that uh, the immune system, for one reason or another, loses its, uh, its capability of defining what is your body and what is not your body. In a case uh, called multiple sclerosis, your immune system attacks the surface of the nerves, the myelin of the nerves. This is like an insulation on an electrical wire. And when your uh, system attacks this myelin, uh, you short circuit the nerves. That's a, a gross description of the disease, but it's very, very uh, distressing, especially in young people. It's seen more often in females, and for some strange reason, it is seen more frequently in the Northwest and in around the Portland area. So we do see a great number of people with uh, multiple sclerosis. There is no specific uh, uh, medicine to cure the disease. We are on the threshold of new discoveries with stem cells and uh, influencing the immune system. But until we do that, we use cannabis frequently to help people who are having uh, s the kinds of symptoms that are distressing, i.e. pain and spasm. Very good. Thanks, doctor. We have another phone call. Hello, caller. You're on our show. Hi, 